Hello and welcome to part four. campaign and um, well this is the rest of the war because I realized that when I'm talking through part three I'm mentioning quite a lot about the command operations and what other things gets up to uh, happens in Norway during World War II rather than just 1940 campaign so I hope you'll enjoy this slight extension of the Norway campaign as usual if you do like Please like, maybe press the subscribe button, the little bell slightly further along. I've got a great Patreon and Discord chats. Hmm. I can never decide which is more fun. I take topic suggestions from both, but the patrons get to vote on it, whereas the Discord one I have to I I just get all powered it's like Right then, I can only avoid this for so long, the Quizlings. Okay, so, the Quizlings. I'm going to zoom out for this one so I can do a bit of reading. Right. There is Joseph Terebroven on... Well, it's on the right of the picture. But I think it's going to be the left as you're viewing it. And to the right of centre uh, as you're viewing it. Sorry. Is um, Vitkin Quisling. Now... Vitgen Quisling, as I've said, visits Hitler in December 1939, and that's when I start to date the plans of invasions of Norway from. Although Admiral Rader had been arguing for him for much longer than that, because of the advantages of it for the Germans in terms of the Battle of the Atlantic. Now, here's the fun thing. Vigden Quisling. On 9th of April 1940, at 7.32, visits the Studio Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation and makes a radio broadcast, proclaiming himself Prime Minister and ordering all resistance to halt at once. The question I ask is, I presume the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation has, I don't know, security? Doorman? An actual... Resolve to have democratic things followed and follow the rule of law? Why is he being allowed to make a broadcast? What is his status? Because the reason I can say this is because every time he goes to any official in government, he gets told to basically feg off and, get, and they, they, they ignore him. But the Broadcasting Corporation allows him to make this freaking announcement. Who cares? You know, we talk about modern leaders and fake news. Fake news! 1940, 9th of April, Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. Please tell me, d d why? Why allow him to do that? Do you really not like the Labour Party that much? But still, this thing? Really? Anyway, he announced that he and the National Assembly were taking over power due to the cabinet having raised armed resistance and promptly fled. Fled. Are you not supposed to resist an invader? This is something new to me. Um, you're supposed to be a nationalist party, and yet you believe the invader should be not resisted. <sighs> The, uh, the Negasvold Council, this cabinet at this point, had um, only moved to Elverum, which was about 50 kilometres from Oslo. Seemed rather sensible, considering it's away from the fighting. Usually you do tend to move away from the fighting. 
So, here's the thing. The next day, the German ambassador, slash first ministry before Joseph Trebron shows up, um, Kerbrugge travels over him and demands Hacken, the king, uh, return to Oslo and formally appoint Quisling as prime minister. Well, Hacken, for starters, goes, no. <laughs> You're invading me, and now you're telling me that you wanted to point. I, 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 the fact he was even grasping an audience is, suggests that the uh, the Norwegians by that point were far too far removed from the Vikings. Um, Hacken points out no one has confidence in Quisling, and then apparently this radio broadcast is an attempted coup. Again, did he turn up with a lot of armed people? I, the, 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 the stories I get are very mixed as to whether or not he turned up with just a couple of people in a car or a mass audience, but still, I'm not, I, I don't know why anyone let him broadcast. And then Quisling is not appointed as Prime Minister because the Cabinet decides not to, because Quisling basically tried to do it anyway, and also... Quisling has no power. He has no support in the government, in the parliament, no support in the cabinet, no support anywhere, no one, no support in the people. Why would anyone make him prime minister? So, Quisling tries to have Nugold at cabinet arrested. But the officer he instructed to carry out the arrest ignored the warrant because Quisling had no authority. And the officer, although I haven't found this exact the quote anyway, but I do have to wonder if the officer asked how he got into his office in the first place. In fact, if I was the officer in question, I'd probably be going, does no one close the doors anymore? Do you see what comes in? Um, attempts at gaining control of the police force. Fail. Because, well, heaven might have asked the questions, why? On what authority? Who are you? There are so many options that could have been asked of Quisling at this point by anyone. Um, the, coup is, the coup is technically considered to have failed after six days. The Germans stopped supporting it after three... classified as failing only after six days. And then Quisling has to step aside in parts of Norway in favour of the Ministry of Council. I would argue that at no point does he step up. I would argue at no point does he actually have any power or influence or actually have the ability to tell anyone to do anything. In fact, Quisling is the definition point of how big an idiot do you have to be to be a, no longer be a useful idiot Victor Quisling at the beginning of the, during the Norway campaign. And I would also like to know that just as Victor Quisling steps aside at this point as being, and I realise all the stuff he does later in Norway, he is not a nice guy, he is useless as a leader in Norway and various other things. But leaning that to one side, I find it so hypocrite he, he says he announces he's stepping aside as leader he, well, he's not he's not he's not leader so how can you step aside from him it's like me saying i'm step asiding uh, stepping aside as the seventh member of mcbusted you've all heard my singing i am the mythical seventh member yeah i've never met them i have never been uh, sung with them or anything but i am the seventh member of mcbusted yeah all right hey caramba This is how little power he has. And a Ministry of Council is formed on the 15th of April by members of the Supreme Court and are supported by Norwegian business leaders, as well as Brewer, and takes over the administration. We won't get into the later things, but let's be honest, Quisling is such a bright spark. He actually believes Hitler when Hitler tells him that Norway will be an independent nation after the war's over. <sighs> the 
get on there. Now, also, some more clarification for Norway campaign. Spitfire. And Spitfire. No, no, no. You're not seeing things. No. Spitfire. Spitfire. According to German pilots who get shot down. No Spitfires appear in the Norway campaign. But the Blackburn skewer does shoot down. The, uh, it does carry out the first actual shot that a shoot down of an enemy aircraft in World War II by the British Royal Navy and possibly by the British over Norway. And yes, we can all commiserate with the German pilot who actually managed to be shot down by a Blackburn skewer. And um, yeah, there was a little competition also between war spite swordfish spotter aircraft and the various other swordfish spotter aircraft over what they could do to German planes as well. It's not nice. They're not nice. So, what else goes on in the war? Operation Claymore. Operation Claymore is the first commando raid in World War II. And interestingly enough, quite a lot of the officers, invo officers involved and the ships involved had been involved at Namsos and had been involved at Nalvik. And had several of them had met Felicia and Carson the Weirt and those officers certainly inspired a lot of the stuff that goes on here. Operation Claymore is that first commando raid. And it's the first proper commando raid as we'd understand it. It uses Queen Emma, Princess Beatrix, um, as the landing ships. They're carrying landing craft assault and landing craft mechanized. So quite good mix. There are four tribal class destroyers. There's HMS Legion, which is She's an L-class destroyer, but she's fitted with an all-four-inch armament, so she's pretty much an air defense destroyer. Most of the tribals have now, by this point, had their X-mount replaced with a double four-inch as well, so they have plenty of AA firepower between them. And they have quite an interesting operation. They don't get much German resistance, and this is the point. They're going to the Lofoten Islands, and they take them over fairly quickly. What limited German resistance there is there is overwhelmed in short order, destroyed in short order. Some of the most resistance they get is from an unarmed coastal ferry, where the German equivalent of the Entertainment National Service Association Group Put a gun to the head of the ship's captain so that Bedouin had to sink the ship, then rescue the survivors, including the officer and the captain. The officer was had his gun removed of him and was basically called a prat by everyone. The idea that one side in any war has a monopoly on the prats and the twats. No. Right. Aftermath of Love Hutton Opera Raid Operation Claymore. As you can see, lots of things were smoking. This, what was the point of this raid? Fish oil. Needed for lubricating things. And destroying it was very useful. Also, most of the Royal Navy destroyers went back with a huge amount of fish on board. I mean, they loaded up with tons. And fishermen. And fishing boats. And other merchant ships which were wanted were taken back. Although uh, some Royal Navy landing parties were very disappointed that the ships they were aiming for, refrigeration ships, were actually destroyed by tribal class destroyers because no one had told them that they wanted that particular ship to go home in. So they thought they were supposed to just blow it up. Lots more raids follow. Lots, lots more raids follow. 
including the air fuses get involved in a lot of operations in Norway because, again, it's confined waters going into fjords rather like the Mediterranean. So air fuses in tribal class destroyers and some of the other larger destroyers become the big things. Motor torpedo boats become very, very important as well. After Operation Claymore, you have Operation Gauntlet, Operation Anklet, Operation Archery, Operation Musketoon, Operation Freshman, an unknown operation, Operation Cartoon, Operation Crackers, Operation Brandy, Operation Roundabout, and Operation Checkmate. Here's the interesting thing. There are 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11, 12, including Claymore, listed operations for Norway. Now, I'm a little old-fashioned. I must admit, I'm a historian. But, the fact is, there are 12 operations listed there, which is a good thing. But those are 12 operations... which are the publicly known ones. I'm fairly sure there are a lot more. There is all the SOE activity going on in Norway. There are all sorts of operations which are taking part in terms of reconnaissance operations, keeping an eye on the German forces, monitoring their movement, monitoring the large ships based there, doing out reconnaissance for air attacks and all sorts of things. There are hundreds of operations conducted in Norway during World War II. And all of it didn't need to be done. The whole thing for Norway is that it does tie down a whole lot of German resources. But it also ties down a lot of Allied resources. And if you think about it, imagine the Arctic convoys with Norway as an Allied power. Imagine the North Atlantic campaign with Norway as an allied power. Imagine all the potential operations with Norway as an allied power. You want to open up a second front? Do you do it from the UK and go into France, or do you do it into Denmark and go from Norway? Imagine the Battle of France if Germany had been fighting a serious fight up in Norway if they'd actually been given far more of a organized and a strategic level defense. So, that's what part five will be about. And I had to go into the quiz things at some point, so that was this one. Hence, we'll have some warnings on it. And the various operations that take place, the various rather cool operations. If you really want fun, look up Operation Anklet. It doesn't sound like it, but they do get up to some really weird stuff in the flora. And Operation Archery in Vagasoy do as well. Um, Norway is one of those campaigns and potential areas of operation which really is interesting. And so it's the, there's no surprise it's the first commander operation because it's the area which has so many critical supplies for Germany. So many critical supplies. Fish oil, iron ore, 
all sorts of things without which the German war economy would have ground to a halt. Fish. Anyway, thank you. Hope you enjoyed part four of five.